Last episode, we introduced the idea of the Dorian Principle, which is explained in Conley Owen's completely free book. We left the interview wondering how this applies to Bible translations and manuscripts, so we're back to finish the conversation and apply Jesus' principle of freely giving to those issues. We'll also discuss how the concept of intellectual property is unbiblical, goes against natural law, and more. I'm Andrew Case, and you're listening to Working for the Word. Here we go. Obviously, copyright is something that governs content. The Bible is content, and therefore, whenever you've got the Bible, you have this issue in the background restricting its flow, uh, restricting access to it. So how do you how do you deal with that? And this happens at all the levels, right? It's the manuscripts, it's the critical edition, it's the translation, and then it's the, the printing of the translation, etc. So starting from the beginning, or even uh, going back further than the beginning to manuscripts and copying. In the book, I told a story about a a monk named Finian who got a Bible. And so this is uh, in the mid-6th century. This became uh, kind of an interesting story in copyright circles, because a lot of people, when talking about copyright, only focus 18th century and onward, because that's when copyright began. But this is one of the, the first examples you have of people asserting rights over content prior to that. And so anyway, there was this Irish monk named Finian who got a Bible from Rome. And there was another uh, monk named Colum Cole who ends up copying this other monk's Bible when he didn't know <laughs> when he didn't know that's what he was doing. And so he claimed that th- this Bible that this other monk copied was his property because it was copied out of his Bible. And he ended up winning the case. So this is something that you've seen Christians litigating against other Christians over over the Bible for for a long time and man it's it's really sad that uh, someone would want to restrict access yeah. to the word of God and moreover that they'd be willing to violate 1 Corinthians 6 to do it you know 1 Corinthians 6 saying not to take another brother to court so moving on to just manuscripts so manuscripts, you wouldn't think there'd be any problem there, right? Because manuscripts are, you know, they're really old. They've got to all be in the public domain. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that a lot of people, when they take a photograph of those manuscripts and they digitize them in the form that, you know, scholars would have access to because they're not going, scholars generally aren't going to be going and touching the actual papyrus. Once you take that photograph, you can then assert that you have copyright of that photograph and then restrict access that way. Now, there is court precedent that says that this isn't that this isn't the case that if you have a mechanical reproduction of a public domain work that mechanical reproduction is itself public domain so as long as there wasn't any um, kind of artistic improvement made to the public domain work anyway that they shouldn't be able to do that unfortunately museums don't have a whole lot of ways of making money so this is often the way they do it is by asserting copyright over these things that they possess you know I have a friend who has a website where he hosts pictures of images of uh, Bible manuscripts. And he's gotten takedown letters written to him from a museum. <laughs> and he didn't know what to do and didn't want to deal with it. So he so he just went ahead and took the image down because he didn't want to deal with whatever lawsuit would entail. Because that's the other thing is it, it's not really about, you know, who's in the right or who's in the wrong, rather than, you know, who is willing to <laughs> endure the litigation that will ensue who and who has yeah. the money to pursue it. So it's, it's really a, a shame uh, the way some of these things work. Mm-hmm. You also have the case with uh, CSNTM, you know, the Center of Studies of New Testament Manuscripts. So they've got, yeah. they've got all these different manuscripts digitized. And I say <laughs> very vaguely, all these different manuscripts, basically, they're the forefront in, in this work of trying to digitize all the New Testament manuscripts. And if you go and you browse their manuscripts, you can get access to a lot more than you used to be able to on there. But there's a lot where you click through and it takes you to some you know, low res image on some uh, museum website, or there's no image at all, even though they have a record of having an image of this thing. And there was one talk I went to where Dan Wallace, who's the president of the CSNTM, I went to his talk and I, I asked him, you know, why this was the case. And he said, 
well, these different museums and monasteries where we get these things, they they have copyright on them. And I, I mentioned the issue about court precedent and that that wasn't necessarily the case. And he says, well, we have to keep good relationships with them so that we we can continue to to take photographs of these things. And mm. <laughs> I I handed him yeah. my card, which uh, at the time had to, had to do with licensing on a on a large software project. And told him, you know, I'd be happy to help you if I if I can, because I'd really love to see the word of God in the hands of the people of God. But right yeah. now, it, yeah, it's it's a shame that there's a, a lack of transparency there. And by transparency, I just mean, you know, people should be able to see what all the manuscripts are. When I first started studying textual criticism and Bible languages, and I don't I don't claim to be well versed in either of those. I'm just saying when I started studying these in seminary, I thought, oh, you know what would be a neat project if I went and I got all the data from all the manuscripts and tried to like reproduce my own kind of critical text just automatically, you know, with a computer program. And then I realized, well, not only are these things not OCR'd so that I'd actually have text to work with. Um <laughs> Uh, but in addition to that, the photographs aren't even available to me. I have very little to work with. And as I, you know, occasionally we complain about this on forums, people would kind of respond back to me as though I was, you know, arguing against the reliability of the word. And, and it's like, no, I'm not, I mean, I, I guess I trust that, you know, these people aren't lying to me when they're saying that this manuscript says this and this manuscript says that. But like, why can't I see it? That I should be able yeah. to see it. Yeah, so... What do you think CSNTM should do? That's a that's a really good question. That's a really good question because I mean that concern Dan Wallace has is is correct, right? Like you don't want to burn the bridges you have to continue digitizing manuscripts. I don't know. Like part of me wants to say, well, digitize all of them, and then when you're done, then you turn the tables on them and just go ahead and release them. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> ah, gosh, it's a. Uh, but yeah, maybe maybe pushing for these things, or maybe um, yeah, there's got to be some kind of uh, negotiations that can be made, or or you could also try to organize support to support these institutions institutions in ways that they'd be satisfied. Now, I don't like, you know, paying ransom to those who are holding things hostage, but um, but these are right. secular institutions, you know, I'm not expecting them to abide by uh, scriptural commands or anything like that. So, sure. yeah, I, I'm not sure what could be done there, but I wish I wished more Christians cared about it. You know, I wish these institutions cared about it more, and I'm, I'm sure Dan Wallace does. It's just that I think a lot of people have a different bar set for what we should want as a church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so keep going. You started with manuscripts. What's next? Right. Now on to, on to critical editions. Critical editions can also be copyrighted, at least, you know, in theory. There's not as much form of litigation about this that would let me tell you with confidence as to whether or not something would stand up in court or not. And also, by the way, my, my day job involves licensing, but I am not a lawyer and none of this is real legal advice. Right. <laughs> and none of this like uh, reflects the view of my employer. So anyway, yeah, but if you think about what someone is accomplishing, Publishing in a critical edition, a, an ideal critical edition is reproducing the autograph, right? They're reproducing the original writings of the apostles. Now, should that be copyrightable? If you are, if you are claiming to be very objective about this, to being completely non-artistic, and you know, copyright is something that's only supposed to apply to artistic works, not to raw mechanical reproductions of things right. or, you know, scientific creations. So that's just uh, really wild that someone would claim to be trying to get as close to be as non-artistic as possible and then claiming an artistic right over that thing. Mm. I have a I have a lawyer friend who once told me that there are have been cases where someone transcribed public domain sheet music and someone else copied that sheet music and then the original person who transcribed it found some typos they had made in the transcription and then asserted copyright and called those things you know uh, artistic editions oh. so that that original wow. <laughs> so that person who made the copy was allowed to make wow. the copy like it's just so insincere you know this thing it it, it was it was uh, made of old uh, people who are trying to you know scientifically reproduce what had been originally written. Uh, they shouldn't be they shouldn't be asserting some kind of artistic artistic ownership yeah. of it. And then continuing on to translation, which is what yeah you work the most with. So there was a book written uh, some time ago, which I don't know if you've ever talked about it on your podcast, but uh, Tim Jory's book that talks about. Uh, Oh goodness! What is the book called? It's not called Spiritual Famine. It talks about spiritual famine. <laughs> it's called uh, Christian the, Commons. The Christian Commons. Yeah, 
that book, so the Christian Commons kind of helped me to see, not that I wasn't already somewhat aware of how difficult it would be, but but copyright really hinders translation work a lot. Because once you have this uh, critical edition that's copyrighted, you know, if that's what you're translating from, well, now you need permission from the person who made the critical edition. You need permission from whoever owns the copyright of whatever it is you're translating. And then there's issues with the tooling that you might use. And there's something I've considered doing is, let's say you took all the different Bible translations, you know, that were somewhat respectable, and you had a program that went through and every time those translations agreed, which, you know, for any verse or any phrase, you know, probably probably you're going to find a lot of agreement. Anytime you have more than one say something, you take whatever the majority say, and then you pick randomly from those. And so no one can say that you're, that. oh, here you're copying the ESV, because the ESV is going to say the same thing as the NASB on that point. <laughs> you basically, you pick some, you, you always pick the phrasing where you can never be sure of which translation you're copying from. Uh, right. <laughs> these are interesting thought experiments on how to possibly get around copyright. I don't know. I, I'm sure someone could still succeed in suing you if they had enough money. But yeah, <laughs> but, uh, yeah these are a lot of the difficulties. So, yeah, translations and copyright uh, have been a problem for a long time. And a lot of people think that, for example, a lot of people think that the King James Version isn't copyrighted. Uh, not the case. It actually is copyrighted. The crown eternally controls that copyright. I forget who who uh, manages it right now, if it's Cambridge or Oxford, but they have different institutions manage it for them. And that's not enforced outside of the UK, but inside of the UK, you would actually have to get permission to print more copies of a King James Version. Wow. That, that was the news to me when I read your book, for sure. Yeah. And then you have... Uh, yeah, you have some modern translations that are trying to uh, be looser about copyright. For example, the NET, that was kind of one of the things that it added. I know a lot of people like it because of the translation notes, but one of the other innovations there was it, it trying to have a, a looser license. Unfortunately, it's not that loose, mm-hmm. and it's not using any of the standard licensing uh, like Creative Commons. For those who don't know about Creative Commons, basically there's a, a suite of licenses for people who want to give away a little more control from their copyrighted work to the public. So it's not it's not one of those standard licenses, it's their own custom thing, which makes it hard to understand and kind of hard to work with, hard to pair with other licenses if you ever make a mixed work between multiple things. Yeah. So there's this other issue with fair use where basically fair use says that you can use uh, a copyrighted work for either purpose of parody or as reference. And so that's why it's allowed for people to quote other authors without getting their permission up front. But the law is not very clear on what counts as fair use. You know, how many words are you allowed to quote before you're basically just reproducing their work? Yeah. And so these different Bible translations... Uh, these different versions, they give you their limits. Basically, these are the limits at which we promise not to sue you. You know, if you only quote this many words, or you don't quote a whole book of the Bible, you know, if you quote Third John, all of Third John, most of them say that you're no, <laughs> you're no longer protected once you've done yeah. that. Yeah, it's interesting how that works. You know, if you want to write a tract and you end up using too much scripture, then you've got to get permission from whatever Bible translation you're using. Yeah, so this brings us into the issue of copyright, the whole philosophy and whether it's even a biblical category of intellectual property, all of that. So I would love to hear you speak a little bit about that. Why is it not enough for me as a Bible translator to just give away my translation for free, even though I hold all of the rights? Isn't it enough that I'm just giving it away online, you know, on Bible Gateway and whatnot? You version, people can read it online, they can read it in an app. Why do I have to do more? Right, that's a that's a great question. So thinking about this in terms of co-labor and reciprocity, remember support is something material or otherwise. So it doesn't it doesn't have to just be when money is changing hands. Anytime you are making someone directly obligated to you rather than directly obligated to the Lord, there's a problem. So in the case of asserting copyright over a Bible translation, for example, you are restricting their use of it. You're saying you can use this, but you are obligated to me and that, you know, if you ever use this, you need to either give attribution these ways or you can't, you can't distribute in this way or you can't retranslate it, right? That's another thing that a lot of people don't realize is, you know, if you have something fully copyrighted, then people aren't allowed to translate that thing. So you're, you're disallowing, you know, translations that someone might take your 
your translation, move it to another dialect or something. I don't know. You're restricting a lot of things. And essentially, the problem with the Dorian principle is that you are imposing a direct obligation rather than freely offering this gospel ministry. So as far as the Dorian principle goes, that's the problem is that that's a matter of reciprocity, even if it's just uh, licensed compliance that's being given in return and not money. Now, there's this additional question of, well, is copyright okay at all? And that that definitely is an additional question. I have it in the appendix for a reason. <laughs> I think that someone can affirm the, the Dorian principle without necessarily coming to the same conclusions I come to as far as uh, copyright mm-hmm. goes. But if you think about, and I think a lot of Christians might be more uh, attuned to thinking about the limits of government in, in the past few years as you know, we've really had to think about, well, how much, how much rights does the government have and how many rights do the people have? and where are those lines drawn. The Bible talks about rights quite a bit. And essentially, I believe that the government's limitations as established in the Noahic Covenant end with property rights. So for for the government to, to go beyond this or to create a new definition of what property is, is to go beyond the right that they have to, to govern. So in the case of in the case of intellectual property, is it real property? I think the law itself admits that it's not. If you look at the statute of Anne, the original copyright law, if you look at our copyright law in the United States, the things they say that basically this is for the encouragement of artistic works. You know, there's a very utilitarian purpose behind it. Additionally, uh, copyright is always limited. You know, it's only for a set number of years. It's not something that goes on forever. forever. And physical property is to perpetuity. People recognize that it's a real property. It goes on forever. And yeah, when you have intellectual property that that doesn't go on forever, that's, in my opinion, a very clear admission that that this is not real property in the same sense. So, So if you instead think about it as not the property of the one who has created it, but rather the property of the one in whose mind it is, right? Uh, when I when I look at an image, you know, and I've I've got that in my mind, or you send it to me on my computer, and it's now in my RAM, then if that's where the property lies, copyright is doing the exact opposite of enforcing real property, right? It's rather than upholding property rights, it's, it's uh, violating property rights. Whose property is it, right? Is it the one who created it? Or is it the one who has it in their possession? Right? And if I have if I have this in my possession, whether it be in my own brain, depending on, you know, how, how much of a savant I am and I can remember all the details, <laughs> or whether it just be like uh, in my computer, there's a, there's a really good quote from Thomas Jefferson I like that says, for transparency, um, this, is, this is actually about patent law, but I th- think it applies equally well to copyright. Yeah. If nature has made any one thing less susceptible than all others of exclusive property, it is the action of the thinking power called an idea, which an individual may exclusively possess as long as he keeps it to himself. But the moment it is divulged, it forces itself into the possession of everyone, and the receiver cannot dispossess himself of it. Its peculiar character, too, is that no one possesses the less because every other possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine, and he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. That ideas should freely spread from one to another over the globe for the moral and mutual instruction of man and improvement of his condition seems to have been peculiarly and benevolently designed by nature. And when she made them, like fire, expansible over all space, without lessening their density in any point, and like the air in which we breathe, move and have our physical being, incapable of confinement or exclusive appropriation. So uh, you definitely see some of... uh, Thomas Jefferson's departure from historic Christianity here, you know, and he's talking about nature and her, but he's using these Christian phrases of the air in which we breathe, move, and have our physical being. And he's recognizing that physical property is something where uh, you can violate the eighth commandment over it. You know, you can, you can take it from someone else, the eighth commandment being thou shalt not steal. You can take it from someone else and then they don't have it anymore. Uh, ideas are not like that, right? If you make a copy of something, that person has no less of the thing that, that they had before. 
So these are all ways that intellectual property does not function like uh, real property. And you don't see anything like this in scripture, certainly. The closest thing I have found to that is there is in the temple a particular incense that's made where uh, no one is allowed to, to use that same recipe. But the idea itself of what the recipe is isn't restricted. It's just a concoction. <laughs> anyway, that's a, that's a far cry from anything really related to copyright. Yeah, and this was really fascinating to me in the book because I don't think most Christians have ever thought, hey, is there actually a biblical precedent for the idea of intellectual property and copyright? And if there isn't, then why do we have to all be copywriting everything we do, even emails that people send out and... (laughs) I see this on websites, Christian websites, all the time. They've got a little copyright notice. Right. And it's probably probably worth mentioning that, because a lot of people don't realize this, in U.S. copyright law, as soon as it's recorded in a fixed medium, it's copyrighted. You don't have to put a stamp on it. You don't have to register with the copyright office in order for something to be copyrighted. It's copyrighted as soon as you've recorded it. So it's, yeah, it's very odd. In the U.S., you have to take extra steps to make it available for other people to copy. I see. Now, why didn't you decide to lead more strongly with this idea that there isn't really any biblical precedent for it anyway? I've done a I've done a lot of discussing this over the years and people <laughs> I think people are more entrenched in in the idea of intellectual property being legitimate than they are uh, some of the other things that I'm trying to question. Oh. And so I wouldn't want I wouldn't want uh, people to reject the Dorian principle, this distinction of co labor and reciprocity, because they get hung up on what I'm trying to say about about the limits of government. Also, I don't consider myself to be really an expert in the limits of government. It's something I'm still trying to really wrestle with and think through myself. And so this is honestly a lot of this is just me being honest about disclosing where I'm coming from. Sure. Uh, the reason why I'm willing to, in chapter 13, speak so strongly about copyright is because I have this additional reason that not just ministers, but really everyone should be abandoning copyright. I feel like there are so many things right now as as conservative Christians that the government is making possible that we wouldn't necessarily abide by. Like it is it is possible for me to marry another man according to the government, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I would do that as a Christian. So it, it seems to me very similar in the, the issue of copyright. Well, the, the government provides this kind of overarching mechanism for people who want to monetize their ideas. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm, as a Christian, so have to be so entrenched in this. Do you think that's a fair comparison? Right. I, th- I think it is. And what you find as you talk to a lot of Christians about this is they say, you know, and and ones who are actually making the content, they say something like, oh, well, I would never actually sue anyone. I just want to <laughs> keep them from using it. So, you know, it's it's all bark and no bite. Right. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a bit inconsistent or hypocritical, or I'm not sure what the right word is, but I don't think it's a right way of going about it. You know, we should just go ahead and yeah. And if, if we're fine with something being freely used, let them freely use it. Now, there are a lot of concerns that people have around, for example, plagiarism or uh, distorting a work. And those I consider very different. Once again, going back to the idea of intellectual property and the Eighth Commandment, uh, the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal, is really a distinct commandment from the Ninth Commandment, which is thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And a lot of these concerns that people have are really Ninth Commandment concerns that Mm. uh, copyright has been co-opted to deal with. So, for example, you mentioned emails a second ago. I had a friend uh, in college who became famous. Well, I only knew him after he was famous, but he became famous because he leaked a bunch of emails that were showing the insecurities of a certain brand of voting machine. And what they did to fight back against him was to assert copyright over all their emails that he had leaked. (laughs) And of course, you know, they didn't really care about them being their property or whatever. It was really about, like, keeping this leak from happening. It wasn't about a, a certain 
asserting uh, artistic endeavor yeah. or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting how these things get co-opted for other purposes. Sure. And one of those purposes is for plagiarism, right? People think that, well, plagiarism is bad. I don't want to be plagiarized. So, But if you look at... If you look at how plagiarism is dealt with, it's hardly ever dealt with with a, an actual copyright lawsuit, right? When you've seen uh, plagiarism happen in the Christian publishing industry, it's the publishers themselves that enforce it, and they shut down the author's work, and they you know stop selling copies because they understand their academ- academic reputation is on the line. Yeah, There's a lot of ways these things are, are dealt with outside of those mechanisms of the law. And there's also defamation. You know, if that's what you're concerned about, your name being attached to something it shouldn't, you know, there's defamation. There's also trademark, which is a, that's the third branch of co- of uh, intellectual property. You have copyrights, patents, and trademark. I consider trademark to be legitimate because that's that's about basically contracts and advertising and things like, and communicating. You know, it's not really about property. Mm-hmm so much. Okay. Another thing is that a lot of people don't realize you can you can plagiarize already public domain works, right? I could I could uh, quote Charles Spurgeon in a sermon at length and not tell anyone I was quoting him and uh, that would be that would be plagiarism. And so, you know, copyright isn't going to magically fix plagiarism. Yeah. Yeah, the best way to keep your work from being plagiarized is to never let anyone see it, which <laughs> exactly. actually happens in India. I was in in a part of India where I went into the local library and they had all the books locked behind glass. And I wanted to read, just, you know, flip through one of those books and they wouldn't let me. I had to go through five levels of permissions, like going to see people's offices to talk to these people and show them my passport and whatnot to finally get permission just to flip through a book. And the reason they told me was because people had plagiarized some of these works in the past. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, oh, so wow. that's, I mean, obviously, you know, if you don't want plagiarism to happen, just don't let anybody read what you've written. It's, it's the best way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I I think there's just so much poor thinking or lack of thinking in this area amongst Christians. And maybe they they just think about one angle of it, or they don't think about any angles of it, and just go with the flow. Right, yeah, it's just just commonly asserted, this is right, you know, we should be paying people for their work. And... Well, once again, yeah, people should be paid for their work, but wherever there's a demand for something, there's a way for money to change hands, even if you don't have these copyright mechanisms in place. Right. You've seen, uh, you know, the advent of Kickstarter and Patreon in the past decade or so, and it's pretty incredible how much people can pre-fund things. Yep. So it's, yeah, we don't have to work on this model where I've got to be able to create this thing that I then can control and sell, pretending like I've got a supply and demand, even though there's an infinite supply. Yeah. To be honest, in Christian circles, in my experience, the reciprocity of paying people for their work is actually seen as a virtue. The more you do that, the, the more virtuous you are because you're, you're rewarding that person for their hard work. Right. Yeah, and obviously that is, a, that is a good thing to do to support a good worker. But once again, you can do that as a co-labor rather than as a customer. And uh, ideally, that's how we would be able to do that. Right. So you're saying when you give, you should be giving to the Lord. You should be giving out of gratitude to the Lord. And this should not be saying, hey, I am now giving to you as a person in exchange for what you've given to me. Right. Now, unfortunately, I'm giving this as an ethic primarily to the one who would be receiving, not to the one who is giving. Sure. So, yeah, if they're if they're setting it up so that you're obligated to them and you give as though you're obligated to them, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. You've kind of been put in a tough spot. But yeah. ideally, we would be able to give in a way that acknowledges God as the, the source of the gospel rather than man. So to finish this up, I want to read some excerpts from Conley's book, particularly from the chapter on copyright and from part of the appendix. So he says, stepping back and examining things through the lens of sincerity, we must question the earnestness of one who asserts all copyrights over the content of their ministry. If they impose restrictions or require payment, can they truly say that they operate as a servant of Christ? If they impose restrictions or require payment, 
Can they truly say that they are a servant to all so that more might be one? See 1 Corinthians 9.19. To be clear, I think highly of fellow pastors who have writing ministries, many of whom engage in the kind of exchanges forbidden by the Dorian principle. Most have never directly faced this issue and therefore have made their decisions in ignorance. In a sense, I hold nothing against them because I likely would have taken the same steps had I never been led to especially ruminate on the passages we've examined. However, all this being said, I cannot ignore the logical conclusion of what the Bible says about sincere ministry. From a human perspective, the error is understandable. From a divine perspective, these models of ministry culpably transgress Christ's plan for the advancement of the gospel. While the day-to-day activities of the local church largely remain within the boundaries set by the Dorian principle, the advent of the Christian publishing industry has introduced breaches of sweeping proportions. Believers who want to deepen their knowledge of the faith frequently find themselves required to give to an author or publisher, i.e. the copyright holder, before receiving the benefit of some ministry. The issue goes much further than books, encompassing Bible study software, performance rights for worship songs, etc. Of course, it has not always been this way. While the Dorian principle has always been in danger of being violated, for the majority of the life of the church, there were relatively few opportunities for temptation or confusion to arise. However, the advancement of publication technology, especially as it has culminated in digital media, has presented the church with a test of faithfulness. Unprepared for the challenge set before her, the church has blindly followed the model of the world in its publication practices, distributing materials for a fee. Additionally, as the cost of reproduction and distribution wanes, being virtually negligible for digital content in the present era, the severity of transgression waxes stronger. Prior to the 20th century, to purchase a book was to purchase a bound edition of printed pages. One was not paying for the content so much as they were paying for the tangible product as a whole, a matter of limited ethical concern. Today, a physical book and its content are more easily distinguished as paper and data. While people still purchase paper books, the sale of ebooks indicates that publishers intend to charge not only for the physical good, but also for the content. A completed work may be disseminated online to millions at no cost to the producer. Yet ministering entities often default to charging for this service. Not only does the use of copyright protection have potential to violate the Dorian principle, but in most instances, it constitutes the most direct violation conceivable. Regardless of the intent of those behind such ministries, to require payment in exchange for religious education is to engage in the practices condemned by both Scripture and the early church. End quote. Now, moving on to what he writes in the appendix of the Dorian Principle about intellectual property, I want to touch further on this because we spoke of it briefly in the interview, but there's more to say here. He says, while theologians differ on the matter, I would argue that a biblical view of natural law delegitimizes the entire notion of intellectual property. First, it should be recognized that copyright law is an artificial imposition on the economy of creative works. In the words of Christopher May and Susan K. Sell, intellectual property constructs a scarce resource from knowledge or information that is not formally scarce. Ideas are inherently reproducible, and in a digital age, the cost of reproducing most works is negligible. However, copyright protection maintains an economy around the selling and buying of licenses to obtain copies of creative works and the rights to use them. Beyond this initial observation, the relatively recent advent of copyright regulations demonstrates their nature as purely human inventions. If they were instead codifications of a divine principle, 
one would expect such statutes to appear earlier in human history. Additionally, while most relevant laws protect material property to perpetuity, the copyright protection offered by governments is, in all but a few circumstances, temporary. This constitutes an implicit concession that intellectual property is not property in the truest sense. The fact that some of these protections last for 20 years and some longer than a lifetime testify to the arbitrary nature of intellectual property law. And I want to stop here and just say, I am astonished continually that nobody, really nobody in the Christian world is talking about this, at least to my knowledge. And I think that's a tragedy. Why aren't we even having conversations about this? We may not all agree on it, but it's not even on our radar as a topic. The question, once again, is, is intellectual property a biblical category? Is it biblically defensible to say we can create arbitrary laws to make knowledge and ideas scarce resources solely for the sake of commercialization or monetizing them? Where are the great Christian thinkers of our time engaging in this discussion or debate? Now, to be fair, both Vern Poitras and John Frame, both men whom I deeply respect, have engaged or touched on this issue briefly in some blog posts, but it doesn't seem to have gotten much traction or gone very far. So, it's astonishing to me that Christians are refusing to even think about this while we have unbelievers who are writing entire books on the subject. I'll link in the description a free book that's about intellectual property. It's called Against Intellectual Property. You should definitely read it. Read it twice like I did, and you will definitely learn something. Honestly, I think it's shameful that the world is leading in this rather than the church where we claim to be closest to the heart of God, which is a heart overflowing with generosity, freely giving to undeserving sinners constantly at great cost to himself. If you didn't know this, even secular nations like Switzerland are now requiring grant-funded academic research to be published as open access. And I think it would be tragic if the church failed to be as generous as secular institutions. Anyway, let me continue reading from the book. With material property, a violation of the Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal, results in direct loss for another. With intellectual property, undesired copying and use of a published work may only be counted as a loss when estimating the potential of an idea to garner profit. And then he quotes from Jefferson, which you heard earlier, and he says, In my estimation, the language employed in copyright legislation betrays the underlying utilitarian motives. The U.S. Constitution gives Congress the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. The Statute of Anne established copyright law for preventing the detriment of authors and proprietors for the future and for the encouragement of learned men to compose and write useful books. Rather than flowing from natural rights endowed by our Creator, copyright law arises from a pragmatic desire to model the economy of creative works after the economy of physical goods. If it can be granted that the government has a sweeping authority to wield its power to improve the lives of its subjects, modern copyright may have some place in society. If instead the God-ordained authority of the civil magistrate is limited to the enforcement of retributive justice, the government may only prosecute those who have violated the natural rights of another. In this view, lex talionis, combined with the deuteronomic principle that justice shall not be perverted by other prerogatives, restricts governing authorities from erecting legislation extraneous to the violation of one's property rights. 
If copyright is not a natural right, then its protection is not a legitimate function of government. If copyright is not a natural right, then it is unethical for any man or ministry to use the power of the government in a court of law to enforce copyright. In fact, rather than a protection of the copyright holder's rights, such an action would be a violation of the consumer's rights as they ought to be able to do as they please with the information in their possession, end quote. Now, to wrap this up, in my experience, most people who violate the Dorian principle do so in ignorance because they basically are following the flow of the status quo. Everyone around them is doing it. They've never seen a different way. And it's been done for so long, so why change anything? So most people just have no idea there's any other way to think about this. Well, if you're listening to this, now you do. So let's walk through some of the things that I would anticipate somebody listening to this, reading Conley's book, and then still refusing to make a change in the way they publish books or resources for Bible translation and gospel ministry. But let's focus on Bible translation. Say you've written a book on how to translate the Bible, which we might title Translation Principles or something like that. What could possibly motivate someone to stick with the status quo and charge money for it? Let's walk through this scenario and talk about some of the reasons that I've seen. So number one, it's like buying and holding onto a lottery ticket. A lot of people think this way. They have such a high view of themselves that they say, well, you never know. This book might become a bestseller, and if it does, I'll get rich. We've all been fed the triumphant stories of the poor writers who, against all odds, managed to break out of poverty and become rich through their pens. The book that everyone turned down and said wouldn't sell is finally picked up by some obscure publisher, and boom, it takes off, and the writer enjoys fame and fortune for the rest of their lives. So, J.K. Rowling is a modern example of this. So by holding on to copyright and keeping your book within the system, you hold on to the hope that someday it might somehow explode into bestseller status and then you won't have to work another day in your life. Probably most authors are secretly motivated by this idea. But guess what? Books on how to translate the Bible into other languages or books on obscure linguistic features never have and never will become bestsellers or profitable in any significant way. Anyone who dreams that they will has said goodbye to reality and set up camp in a fantasy world. So number two, if it's not the bestseller dream, what else could it be? Well, if an author has a firm grasp on reality, they know that they'll probably only profit a couple thousand dollars off of their book if they're lucky. I'm an author and I can speak from over a decade of experience Sure, I'm not a celebrity author like Ann Voskamp, but I represent the average by far, and Voskamp doesn't write books on how to translate the Bible. Neither does she publish translations of the Bible, which is why she's a celebrity author. So let's say you want to make sure you make a few thousand dollars off your book. So you publish the way everyone else does and ignore the Dorian principle. Was it worth it is the question. What will a few thousand dollars buy you? A couple gallons of gas at today's prices? Was it worth keeping away thousands of people who could have potentially been blessed by your work just for that money? Is placing a stumbling block in the way of Bible translation and the global poor really worth a few thousand dollars to any sincere Christian? If they think about it, probably not. So what else could be motivating them? Well, number three, most people say, if you don't charge for something, people won't value it. This is the most common and, I would say, ridiculous lie that I hear in these discussions. Tell me where this is in the Bible. Thankfully, God didn't listen to this lie, or else he would have made each person who trusts Christ for salvation pay 99 cents for it, maybe more. If you give something of value to someone, does it lose value because they received it for free? Will someone throw a new iPhone in the trash because it was a gift? Will they throw away a gold bar because it was a gift? This argument is so insane and utterly divorced from reality that I simply cannot believe how many people repeat it. It's so embarrassing. Even the most educated people I've met have said this to me over and over. 
Listen, charging money for something does not make it valuable. It's either valuable or it's not. And let me say this, the only reason people repeat this nonsense is because they've been brainwashed by 100 years of abject materialistic thinking and marketing. People play psychological games with price tags all the time to manipulate people for their own gain. Should we do the same with the truth of the gospel or anything that attends directly to the translation of it? Now, number four, let's say none of these things we've talked about have motivated the author. What could it be then? Prestige and pride. The desire for recognition by the right people, by the smart people, by the elite, or simply to be part of the in-group. This is the argument I hear regularly. If you publish something for free and circumvent the big name publishing houses, then no one will care about what you have to say or else people won't respect you as highly as they would if you were published by Brill or Crossway or Zondervan or whatever. But we must ask ourselves whether academic branding is really worth the cost of impoverishing the global church as a result. If I publish my dissertation as a monograph that costs $100, who really is going to read it? It will remain invisible to most rich Americans even. And the rest of the Christian world won't ever receive even a crumb from the fruits of your labor. 99.9% of the time, you will fade into obscurity. But at least you will be able to say that you were published by a reputable publisher. Now, thankfully, more and more people are getting fed up with this within academia. I'll link a draft of a paper by Dr. David Kleins in the description, which talks about how broken this world of prestige publishing is. Here's an excerpt. He says, I have been using academia.edu and recently also ResearchGate for a publication of my research for some decades. I am not the only one. It has for me the following benefits. Number one. The day I have finished a paper to my own satisfaction, I have finished with it. It is now uploaded, out of my hands, I can turn immediately to my next project, and my uploaded paper will not come back for incessant retweaking. Number two, I know that my paper will be immediately forwarded to all those people who have signed up as my followers. Wherever they live and whatever their economic status, they will have immediate, easy, and free access. My readers will not be people who don't mind waiting two or three years for a paper that is no longer my present concern and who have the good fortune to work for an institution that can afford to subscribe to ATLA. Three, I will have done my little bit toward promoting equality of access to knowledge globally. I receive many thanks on this aspect. Number four, if my paper is to be presented orally at a Congress, the audience will be able to see it on their screen if they choose. I always begin by showing where they can locate it on Google. Glance at the footnotes, go back over the wording, and behave like autonomous persons in charge of their own learning rather than passive receptacles for the presenter. Number five, if my paper is not accepted for publication or I lose the drive to hawk it around the journals... My thoughts, good or bad or indifferent, are already available on the internet and I will not have wasted my time. If my work is any good, these benefits will accrue not only to myself, but to quite a large worldwide audience interested in my interests, and I am content. End quote. And number five, finally, there may be one last reason someone would avoid following the Dorian principle for their book on Bible translation. Laziness. I can't tell you how many people I meet who are unwilling to learn new things, even simple things. They call themselves scholars who love learning, but when it comes to figuring out how they could publish their work with quality beauty and for free, they say they don't have time to learn anything. This is a nice way of saying they're too lazy to do the right thing. They're used to sending their work to someone else who will polish it for them, publish it attractively, and then lock it down under copyrights and paywalls. Or they're simply too lazy to learn how to accept donations for their work or do a kickstart project for the sake of releasing their work for free, etc. In an age where you can learn virtually any skill on YouTube for free, I find it increasingly incomprehensible that people are so hesitant to step away from the madness of the traditional publishing industry and find a way to bless more people, especially our brothers in the global church who are marginalized because they're poor. 
But you might say, ah, that's where you're wrong. The prestige of the traditional publishing world will catapult my book into people's hands that would never have read it. If I didn't use that avenue, then my work would impact very few people. Well, my friend, you have to think about two important things. Will your book reach the people who Jesus wanted to reach if you publish it through the traditional publishers? He wanted to reach the poor, but your book will most likely only reach the rich, maybe a lot of the rich. And will you have abided by Jesus' teaching to freely give if you do it that way? Also, let me say a few things about reaching people. My wife and I run Aleph with Beth, a YouTube channel for helping people learn biblical Hebrew. Now, we did not take a professional course on how to build a YouTube channel. We did not get professional consultants involved in helping us set up a film studio. We did not take a marketing course. We did not hire marketers, nor did we take professional video editing courses or start with expensive equipment or rely on a staff of cinematographers. We do everything out of a bedroom and pay no staff. We do not rent an office. We learned everything we know about video production and sound for free online. We have no prestigious backing from some famous brand, publisher, or organization. But as of today, we are quickly approaching 100,000 subscribers after two and a half years. Why? Because I believe God blesses obedience to the Dorian principle. We have always given away everything with zero strings attached. We publish everything now as public domain, And God has seen to our needs. We lack nothing. We have the joy of seeing thousands find success in studying scripture more deeply. Now, there are probably many other excuses and reasons that people have in their hearts to stay away from the Dorian principle. Maybe one of them is simply a lack of faith. We don't believe that God could actually supply our needs if we give things away for free. If we give away gospel ministry for free. And we don't even want to try. I've talked to so many people who have objections to this, and then when I ask them, hey, did you actually try? Did you give it a go and step out in faith and see what God does? And the answer is no. They just even haven't tried. They haven't even given God the opportunity to supply above and beyond their needs. And lastly, I will just say that besides being a severe stumbling block and hindrance to Bible translation and just the growth of the church globally, the copyright all rights reserved and commercialization of Christianity is just discouraging to people like me in Bible translation. I am constantly confronted with the paucity of resources available to my brothers and sisters in Latin America who are trying to do Bible translation to the best of their abilities, and there just isn't enough stuff for them to use, enough tools, enough resources. And when I ask those publishers if I can translate those into Spanish and circulate them to my brothers and sisters who need them, they say no. Believe me, I've tried. So the question is, how much longer can we as a church endure this? How much longer will God have patience with us? How much longer can we put up with the hypocrisy of Bible translation organizations who consistently bombard us with the urgent need of Bible translation? Oh, these poor people who are dying without the scriptures, the Bible poverty that we see all around us, and then they turn around and they lock down all of their resources with copyrights and refuse to share them with others. So far, I am unaware of any major Bible translation organization who is not guilty of this hypocrisy. And it grieves me, and it often makes people like me just want to throw in the towel, if we're being honest. If you're a little bothered by this like I am, here's what you can do. Like the Facebook page of the Dorian Principle to show your support, because the more likes that Facebook page gets, the closer Conley says they will be to having a conference about this. And please help spread the book. It's free to spread in any format, like we said, even hard copies. You can order and send hard copies to anybody you think might be blessed and benefit from reading the ideas in that book. And let me just reiterate that the hard copies are free and the shipping is free. So what are you waiting for? This is even better than the Gospel Coalition's theological famine relief efforts. 
where you still have to pay the shipping and you have to sign all these agreements that you're going to give those copies away, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to worry about any strings attached with the Dorian Principle book. Finally, if you have a bunch of biblical arguments that you think contradict the Dorian Principle and you would like to engage in a friendly online public debate with Conley Owens, the author of the book, please write to him. He is actually actively looking for more engagements of that sort. Anyway, that's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. This is a podcast where we believe the Bible is a God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. This podcast exists ultimately to help us treasure the Bible more, go deeper into it, and become like the man of Psalm 1. Psalm 1.